falsehood. Fibs. Deception. Porkies. Untruths. Fabrication. There are many different terms, but at the end of the day, it's lying. I have so many questions that are unanswered about lying. Who are the liars? Why do they lie? Are there good reasons to lie? Or is it always a nasty thing? What are the signs that someone is lying to you? I generally look for if they're looking at you in the face, if their eyes are averted, then sort of consider that they're lying. Well, it's very hard. Some people could tell perfect lies and you don't know if they're lying or not, eh? They can't look you in the eyes. I've noticed nose flaring. Uh, their nipples get hard. If they over-explain it, you know that there's something a little bit dodgy about it. Well, I guess if it's a politician, you can see their lips moving. No one likes being lied to. I hate being lied to. I know I can stop myself from lying, but I can't stop other people from lying to me. So it would be really great if I could tell when someone was lying to me. I've seen Hollywood shows about this, but that's all very well. They're great lie catchers, but is it real or is it just Hollywood? I'm an average bloke. I've got a wife, two grown-up kids, a dog. I'm a little bit short for my weight, but here's the important thing. I've had no police or psychological training, and I'm not really sure if I could pick a lie. So, I've set myself a quest to become a real-life human lie catcher. Well, I thought I'd start with a guy I went to school with, Dr. David Craig. He's written a bestseller on lie catching and he's presenting at a conference this weekend. So I thought I might front him there and see if I can get a few tips on lie catching. How often do people lie? Ah, that's an interesting question. The research shows that we lie around about once in every 10 minutes of conversation. Every 10 minutes? If, if you can just pause and consider the role and function of lying in society, these statistics start to make a bit of sense. Is it always a bad thing to lie? No, it's not. There's some good reasons to lie. You might lie to protect from embarrassment, or you might lie to protect someone else's feelings, for example. OK, like, um, hey kids, I really liked those socks you gave me for Father's Day. That's right. It might be the tenth time you've received the same gift, but you want to protect the feelings of the child. There are different sorts of lies, aren't there? There are. There's some very sinister sorts of lies, and this is what lie catching is about. It's about trying to protect yourself and those that you love. Um, the sinister categories of lies, such as gaining an advantage over you, or shifting blame, avoiding punishment, these are the lies that we really want to be able to detect. You've written a book called Lie Catcher that teaches people how to pick up some of these signs. Yes. Do you think you could give me some training? I'm happy to do that. Uh, before we do, uh, it would be good to test your baseline capability. Uh, who knows, you might fall into the small category of people termed lie wizards. Lie wizards? Sounds like something out of Harry Potter. Uh, it does, but it's a term that we give to people with a natural ability of detecting deceit with 80% uh, accuracy, with no specific training or knowledge. So the test to establish my baseline ability turned out to be a seemingly endless stream of people of all ages and sizes coming into a room and either lying to me or telling the truth. I had to pick it. How hard can that be? Hello. Hi. Okay. Tell me, what sort of car do you drive? I drive a Corolla. Is it a two-door or four-door? Four. And is it a zippy little thing? Oh, it goes okay. <laughs> I think you're lying. <laughs> Hi. I was wondering what car you drive. A Master 6. A Master 6? Indeed. Is it two-door or four-door? Four. -door? four. And four cylinder? Yes. And is it um, a comfy car? Yeah, I like it. Is it a fast car? It's okay, it takes a while to get up to speed. I think you're telling the truth. <laughs> Hi. Hi. I'm wondering, have you ever been overseas? No. No, not yet. Hoping to one day though. I think you're telling the truth. Well, picking lies turned out to be very difficult. I thought I'd actually be okay at it, but although I got a couple right here and there, 
I was really just guessing. Trying to see if I thought they looked guilty or not, which is not actually that easy to see. I know there were signs to look for, but I didn't really know what they were. It was pretty obvious that I needed training. And this was confirmed when David showed me my results the next day. Well, I've got to say, you're not a lie wizard, Brett. <laughs> <laughs> I suspected I wasn't. No, but look, your results came in from yesterday's uh, tests at 42%, um, which is not unusual. However, the average is 45 to 55%. So usually about as good as a toss of a coin, you weren't quite up to that level oh, yesterday. I'm a bit below average. <laughs> yeah, but look, I wouldn't be hurt by that. Um, remember we spoke about lie wizards previously yeah. and how accurate they are. The research in relation to the lie wizards showed there was no correlation between intelligence and their accuracy in detecting lies. So take heart in that. Right, okay. Do you think there's any chance that I could um, get up to an acceptable level of being a lie detector? Certainly. I mean, if we give you some knowledge and some training, we can certainly pick that percentage up. Um, I'm confident that we can pick you up to being relatively accurate and certainly more accurate than you are now. So knowing I was going to be trained in lie detection was pretty exciting. But while David cleared his calendar, I thought I should take a look at what was already out there in the field of lie detection. And of course, the obvious place to start is the polygraph. Paul Woolley is a polygraph expert and he agreed to put it through its paces for me. So Paul, how does it work? Well, a polygraph records physiological reactions as you're answering a series of questions. When a person tells the truth, they don't process that question as much as they do as when they tell a lie. So when uh, they did the research on this, they used nuclear medicine PET scans. When the brain becomes active, it's the different parts of the brain become different colours. So what they noticed was when people lie, their brain is ten times more active, or it was ten times more colour than when they were telling the truth. One of the theories is that you, when you lie, you actually metabolise more energy because your brain becomes a lot more active, so that will cause a change in physiology. The other theory is the fight or flight response gets activated when you're telling a lie because you create an external threat to yourself by telling someone an untruth and the threat being that it might get caught in that lie. So what happens in the test is people will, will try to think of ways that they can beat the test. So they might try to think about something else instead of focusing on the question. But when they do stuff like that, it actually stimulates their physiology more. It's very hard to stop a reaction. Um, it's actually almost impossible to stop a reaction to a question that you're lying about. So Paul wired me up for the test. And for simplicity's sake, he asked me to secretly pick a card with a number on it. Then he would ask me whether the number was any of four possibilities. I was to answer no each time. One of these answers would be a lie. You need to sit still, try not to move, mm -hmm. and just answer no to every question I ask you for the sake of this. Okay. And at the end of it, I should be able to tell you what the number is that you've got. Okay. Based on the fact that you should have reacted more to that than the others. All right. Yeah. Is the number on that card you picked the number 18? No. Is the number on that card you picked the number 15? No. Is the number on the card you picked the number 10? No. Is the number on the card you picked the number 5? No. So Paul, how did I go? Were you able to pick the lie? In this case, the number that you have the biggest reaction to is number 10. So that should be number 10. Number 10. Well, as good as the polygraph was at picking up my lie, you'd have to agree it's not very practical for everyday conversations. I'm pretty sure people would notice when you started hooking them up. I needed to know more about lying signs. What's more important, the verbal or is it the non-verbal? Kiralee Hollows is a clinical psychologist at Bond University. I started by asking what she thought of the polygraph. Um, look, they certainly have their, their merits. They're based on um, detecting those non-verbals or those paralinguistics, physiological reactions to, um, to deceiving. And so those symptoms include the perspiration, the heart rate, the inconsistencies in breathing. Unfortunately, the, those, those um, symptoms are also associated with being nervous. Um, they can be unreliable. Which, which do you think is uh, more heavily weighted as, as something to take notice of the verbal or the physical? There is research to suggest that our everyday lies um, are 
probably non-verbals aren't as much as important as what they might be um, and the reason being is because those everyday lies don't actually have that community that that emotional and those feelings um, attached to them um, Nonverbals become more important in terms of being able to identify de uh, deception when we um, have a, a really intense emotion attached to it so if there is guilt or extreme sadness in telling um, in telling a lie then nonverbals will become more important because when we are highly emotional we have less control over our nonverbals as opposed to our verbal content what about sociopaths do you think it's easier or harder to pick a lie from a sociopath than a normal person. It definitely is more difficult to detect in a um, in a psychopath or a person with psychopathic features because they they don't display the emotional content in the same way in, in that the average person might display it. They are much more controlled um, in those contexts. So Kira Lee had some good tips on when to look for verbal or non-verbal signs, but I was really intrigued by psychopaths, perfect liars. I wanted to know more. So I looked up one of Kira Lee's colleagues, Nathan Brooks, a clinical psychologist who deals with psychopaths on a regular basis in his practice. Yeah, I think you know, most people have a moral conscience and that's lacking in those with psychopathy. So you know, most people probably weigh up the pros or the cons or they feel that emotional state that would be attached to, to a lie they would tell it. But for those with psychopathy, that's simply not there. Do they lie because they want to or have to? Well, the very instrumentally driven so you know unlike sort of the average person they're very driven by you know gratification um, by greed power and control so they will lie to go after those qualities just because you know they can what makes a psychopath different to you or i most people will probably have some level of of morals or moral conscience um, and that that's missing um, also the level of empathy is significantly impaired in those with psychopathy and they're probably more calculated, more goal-driven um, and also more grandiose, self-centred and manipulative than the average person. Could there be psychopaths among us and we don't know? Absolutely. <laughs> you know, there's been research showing that, um, you know, there is psychopathic people in, um, corporate, in the corporate world um, particularly in positions including, you know, vice presidents, supervisors, directors. So it's not uncommon for a psychopath to, to reach a, you know, a higher level in the corporate world. Do psychopaths feel the thrill of the lie and getting away with it? Yeah, one of the, one of the biggest predictors of, of psychopathy is um, proneness to boredom and need for stimulation. And that, you know, taking on a lie or, you know, trying to... Um, engage in any type of impulsive or thrilling, thrilling behaviour, you know, it, it can be very fulfilling and exciting for these individuals. And that's often why we see that these individuals take on great challenges. Now, how could somebody like Lance Armstrong get away with lying for so long to so many people? Traditionally, people have viewed him as a very powerful and sincere character. You know, he's been up there with, you know, US presidents and that type of authority and you know, he's built, built a legacy for himself. And when you build something like that, I guess, first of all, you have people wanting to believe. Yeah. And then also you believe it as well. So it's a bit of a, quite a powerful tool. And that is partly why he was able to get away with it so well, because he built something that was nearly like bringing down an empire. So I've learnt from the experts that it's not so much what a person says, it's how they say it, their tone, their body language, that's going to give away a lie. So I did some more research and I found an interesting study. There was a group of psychologists in the US who did a study with aphasics. Now aphasia is a condition that affects the left hemisphere of the brain. And one of the results of aphasia is that the patient is left with the inability to understand language. Words mean nothing. So there's two groups, aphasics and normal brain functioning people. And they were both asked to pick the lies. The aphasics were better. Even though they couldn't understand the words, all they could see was the facial expressions, the body language, and listening to the tone of the voice. 
I think that proves that what we say isn't all that important. However, what if you couldn't even see the person? Michael Shepard suffers total visual impairment. He's an Australian representative goalballer and also a working lawyer. I wondered if his visual impairment made it harder for him to pick a lie. Oh, that's a good question. Um, I suppose how does any lawyer, um, but I would say uh, a lot of it comes down to pausing. Uh, maybe the, the way they say something, whether it's uh, angry or in a monotone or something like that. Uh, sometimes just, just the context of it, you think, hang on, that can't be right. Um, those are sort of the, some of the criteria I use in working out whether someone's lying to me. For a sighted person, we've got body language and facial expressions to help us decide whether someone's lying. You've only really got the tone of voice and what they're saying. Do you, do you think you're more attuned to that? I think you have to be very attuned to the tone of somebody's voice. Um, when you grow up um, and you're forming relationships with people from a really young age, you're very reliant on the tone of voice, especially as a blind person. But as you grow up, I suppose you learn what, what people mean by their tone and I, I suppose you do become more accustomed to. So what particular things in a tone of someone's voice would be an indicator to you that they might be telling a porky? Uh, sometimes if they're too insistent about something, um, so if, if say they, they say something like, I wasn't there, I don't know, something like that, it might give the inference that, hang on, why are you angry about it? I'm asking you a question. Um, and so maybe, it, I don't know whether that shows that they're lying per se or that you just need to dig a little bit deeper. Now, Michael, I'm not sure if you know about aphasics, but they're people who have the left hemisphere of their brain damaged and they can no longer understand language. Now they were pitted against people who had normal functioning brains and they were better at picking the lies. I'm wondering whether you're better at picking lies by having less things to um, distract you. I doubt it. I really, really doubt it. I suppose everybody likes to think they can pick them up, you know, some of the time. Um, I have no idea how good I am at picking it up, to be honest. So what about the other side of the coin? Do you think you're a good liar? I'm a really bad liar. Um, I can't tell a lie to save myself. I either smirk and look silly or look too serious like I'm trying to hide something. Um, what I've heard is that some blind people have the same sort of difficulties. Um, I wonder whether it's partly because we don't have facial expressions to feed off so we don't exactly know what um, other people might portray. Okay, so um, when we meet a blind person, we know that they're honest. I wouldn't go that far at all, <laughs> um, especially if they're a lawyer. So, so far, I've learned that there are certain indicators that show when someone's lying, such as a lack of eye contact or fidgeting. But what worries me, what if these are just normal reactions of someone who's honest but nervous? How do we separate the honest, nervous person from the liar? This liar detection stuff is pretty complicated, but fortunately, Dr. David Craig says he has a solution, and it's magic. The magic lie detection model is a useful tool because it improves accuracy and importantly can help differentiate between an honest, nervous person and someone that's deliberately being deceitful. Before we discuss how the model works though, it's helpful to have a broad understanding of what happens when someone lies. Okay, so what are the responses when somebody lies? Well, when someone tells a lie, they go through three phases just after they've told the lie. The first phase is the emotional response phase, and these are feelings of emotion that the person has, such as fear, anxiety, guilt, and even excitement on occasions. The magnitude of those emotions depends largely on the significance of the lie and the consequences of being caught. Then we go on to the second one, which is the sympathetic nervous response phase. And this is the body going into the fight or flight syndrome. The body starts to react to the amount of emotion that it feels from the first phase. So things will start to change, such as increased blood flow to the nose, causing an itchy sensation. Uh, it can be averting eye contact, breathing becomes more steeped, lips become more pursed 
All those sorts of things uh, occur as a result of lying. Following that, we have the third response, which is the cognitive response. And the cognitive response is a deliberate measure or countermeasure by the liar to try and hide those signs from the observer. OK, so they know they're showing, so they try and hide it. Exactly right. So, for example, if their fingers start to tremble, they might put them out of sight where you can't see them uh, to try and hide that lying sign. But, David, now that we know what the lying responses are, can we get back to the MAGIC model? Sure. The MAGIC lie detection model is a model I developed using the acronym MAGIC. So, if we go through the acronym now, M stands for motivation. Has the person got the motivation to lie to you? If the person has, we go on to A of the acronym, ask control questions. These are questions that we um, know the answer to or we know will be answered truthfully. And as we're asking those questions, we're observing and cataloguing that person's behaviour while they're being truthful. Once we've established a good behavioural baseline, then we go on to G, which is asking the guilt questions. Ah, giving them a chance to lie. That's right, or a chance to tell the truth. Mm. However, when we ask the guilt questions, we move on to I, which is indicators. And that is lying indicators that may change from their baseline behaviour. So we ask the guilt questions, and then we look for indicators that occur in a cluster in response to those guilt questions. So, what might happen is you ask a guilt question and suddenly there's a departure from their normal behaviour um, and with a lying sign and you suddenly think that may be a guilty sign. However, it could also be an honest, nervous person scratching their nose, for example. So we go on to C in the acronym, which means check again. So we run through the entire process again and if we ask a guilt question and we see a same or similar lying sign again, then you've caught yourself a liar. I was to become very intimate with the magic lie detection model over the next week, as David took me under his wing and trained me in all aspects of lie detection. This is good stuff. We covered some of the more common lying signs, such as scratching an itchy nose, your subject looking to your left when they recall something, avoiding eye contact, fidgeting, moistening lips and tongue as a response to dry mouth, we talked about what to look for in the cognitive phase when liars try to cover up their lying signs. Well, what he does is he actually bites the left-hand side of his mouth. He sort of tenses the muscle around his mouth just after he lies. Now, you see it coming up very shortly. Yeah. That was it? That's it. If you can just go forward slightly, you'll see it more, more pronounced. See there how it's asymmetrical? He's biting the side of his mouth just after he's lied. Right. Now, what this is is a more controlled version of what children do. You might have seen children putting their hand over their mouth or um, uh, put their hand right across like that or they might uh, put their hand to their face. As we get older, we do more and more subtle signs, but this is an adult manifestation of that. It's as plain as the nose on your face when you know what to look for. All the time, we came back to the magic lie detection model and the need to establish the baseline behaviour. So let's attempt a recap on what to look for when you think someone is lying. First of all, you have to ask some questions that you know they'll answer truthfully, so you know what their baseline behaviour looks like. If you don't know this, then you might end up wrongly interpreting some little behaviour or quirk as a lying sign when it's not. Then you have to ask the questions that matter. You look for the lying signs, the deviations from normal behaviour. What could they be? Well, there is quite a long list. Some of these lying signs are automatic responses that can't be helped. Things like an itchy nose from increased blood flow associated with the excitement of lying. Dry mouth or dry lips, less colour in the lips. Changes in speech pattern or breathing. Sometimes the pupils will dilate. When the person looks to your left, it could mean that they're making something up. Then there are the signs that the person is trying to cover up these automatic responses because they know they are showing. This is the cognitive phase. Like removing or sitting on their hands that are shaking, placing a hand over their mouth or touching their face, feigning tiredness or giving a fake yawn, extended eye contact because they think it proves they're sincere. The important thing to remember is that these only count if they're a departure from the normal baseline behaviour. Look for these clues in clusters, because there will normally be more than one. Then, to be really sure, check again by repeating the whole process. Only then can you be reasonably sure 
you're caught a liar. Of course, knowing the theory is one thing, but putting it into practice is entirely another. So practice, I did. Trying to pick lies in everyday situations. Sometimes with people David had set up, sometimes with total strangers. It was intense, but I could feel myself improving. Folks, it's do or die time for me. I've had all my training, I've had all my practice. Now it's time to see whether any of that knowledge is actually stuck. In that room, I'm gonna meet a constant stream of people who are either going to lie to me or tell the truth about two main topics. Where they were when the Twin Towers came down and what sort of car they drive. Everything else I ask them, they have to tell the truth and that's gonna give me baseline behavior. I guess I'm as ready as I'm going to be. Wish me luck. Hello. Hello, Amelia, is it? It is. What do you do for a living? I am a circus performer. Okay, is that fun? It is. It's really good fun. <laughs> what sort of a car do you drive at the moment? I drive a Daihatsu Mirror. A little four-cylinder, is it? Mm, I think so. I don't know. <laughs> How many kilometres has it done? Far too many. <laughs> it's on its way out. <laughs> I think you're lying. <laughs> I am. Hi. How are you going? I'm well. Um, have you been involved in education in your life? Well, most of my life I've been involved in education, that's right. Yeah. I was wondering, where were you when the Twin Towers came down? Oh, the towers. Um, Adelaide. I was on a business trip in Adelaide. Okay, what sort of business were you involved in? Education, seminar in, uh, in education down in Adelaide. Was it cold at the time in Adelaide? Uh, it was cool, yeah. yeah. Stayed on the beach in Grenade, it was lovely. Yeah. I think you're lying. Hi, Chris, is it? Yes, that's correct. Chris, wondering where you're from? I'm from Michigan, in the United States. What do you do for a living? Um, I'm a student at the moment. Okay. Uh, do you have any interest in anything else? Um, yeah, I'm working on side projects, making short films and videos, and acting and all sorts of nice things. Mate, I was wondering, where were you when the Twin Towers came down? I, let's see, I was at school and I was in science class and all of a sudden all the TVs came on and next thing you know everybody's crowding around the TVs, so I was in uh, Rock, Michigan. I think you're lying. Going <laughs> right, Tyson? Yes. Uh, Tyson, are you a married man? Yes, I am. Uh, any kids? Three. Had to think about that. <laughs> and how many kids in this marriage? One. <clears throat> yeah, so second marriage, one in the second marriage. Okay, and do you live in a house? Uh, yes. Uh, do you have a pool? Yes. Tyson, where were you when the Twin Towers came down? I was with my brother-in-law. We were having a few beers after a barbecue. Okay, what's your brother-in-law's name? Uh, Stephen. He was, um, I think he was on holidays at the time. We were both on holidays, that's why it was easier, because it happened, what was it, two or three in the morning, or something like that, our time. So we would had a barbecue, had a few drinks, and we were still sitting around. I think you're telling the truth. So David, the results are in from the test yesterday. Um, I'm expecting to see that I've improved because it did feel better. How did I actually go? Well Brett, you actually did improve. The, fir <laughs> the first test you were 42% and the test we did yesterday you came in at 62%. It's quite a market increase. That's uh, pretty good isn't it? Yeah it is, uh, but you couldn't expect to keep uh, uh, improving your, uh, yourself at that exponential rate. But then when you stop and think about it, 62% it's not that much better than a coin toss, is it? No, it's not, no. So, uh, if I keep practicing, am I likely to be able to get up to an acceptable lie-catching level of 80% or something? Absolutely, like with most human skills, 
uh, the more you practice, the more fine you'll become at it and, uh, and the more proficient you'll become at detecting deceit. Were there some obvious signs that I did miss? There was a couple there, Brett, that uh, will perhaps be more obvious to you now if I point them out to you. Okay. Remember in the lie detection model, we talked about when we're looking for deceit indicators, we actually look for not just one sign, but actually a cluster occurring yes. at once, a clue cluster. Um, now this, uh, this gentleman here, when he tells you the lie, that cluster appears. So what I'd ask you to look for here in this cluster is the first thing he does is his eye pattern changes direction from when you're asking him the control questions. Mm -hmm. Immediately following that, there's a pause in his speech. His speech cadence is broken. There's increased speech errors. And this is because his brain has gone to overdrive as he tries to tell you the lie. Then once he's told you the lie, you'll notice that he starts to nod his head in agreement to try and tell you, try and reinforce to you that what he's doing is out or telling you is actually true. Following that, you'll notice a very short nervous sniff and then a feigned yawn. And these are cognitive responses that he's deliberately doing to try and mask his lie. Okay, let's have a look. All right, see how you go. Justin, where were you when the Twin Towers came down? I was, did you notice that? Yep. The eye direction. Eyes, eyes looked up exactly. for the first time. First time, exactly. Yeah. Now watch for this one. With my brother-in-law, we were having... I can see it now, the big pause. Absolutely. Before, yeah. High cognitive load, slows his speech down, interrupts his flow of uh, cadence speech. A few beers after a barbecue. Little sniff. Little sniff, and he's also nodding his head. He's trying to reassure you. Come on, Brett, come on, yeah, believe me. Please believe, believe me. me. Yeah, 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 exactly. Okay. Now, this next one's quite interesting. Watch, mm. for, the, watch for the fake yawn. And okay. whereabouts? In Brisbane. Oh, I can't believe I didn't see that yeah. at the time. It, now, in Brisbane. Yeah, I mean, it's quite obvious when you, you're able to go and look at it in reflection. But yeah. remember, any one of these signs isn't enough, but when you get them in a cluster so close together, you really have caught yourself alive when you see that. Well, it's a lot easier when you can look in hindsight, of course. Yeah. Um, but, you know, what I take away from that is that it's so important to get that baseline behaviour sorted in your head, and you've really got to concentrate very hard and note everything that's going on with a person in their baseline behaviour so that you know what to look for when it's different. That's right. It's worth taking the time to invest in, in learning that really robust, reliable baseline behaviour. And then when deceit uh, indicators come out, they're far more obvious to you. Yeah. Well, I've come a long way. I've got you to thank. So <laughs> thanks for that. I just need to do a bit more practice. No worries, Brett. Good luck. But little did I know, David had one more test in store for me. David, I've got no idea why we're here, but I'm guessing you've got a bit of a test for me. That's right, your accuracy has improved, we've seen that in the recent tests, but what we want to see is can those skills that you've developed transfer from a controlled environment into the real world? Real world being a used car lot. Correct. David introduced me to Scott, who is a real car salesman, and I might add, an honest one. David asked Scott, for the sake of the test, to lie about three things. I had to pick the lies. So Scott, beautiful day to buy a car. Hey, it's always a good day, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> what's what's the weather been like in Brisbane? Mate, yesterday was horrible. Yeah. Cold, horrible day. Today's bloody gorgeous. Yeah. Have you lived down here a while? Uh, been in Brisbane now for about ten years. Okay. Yep, yep. You obviously like it. Yeah, yeah. It serves a great purpose. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I got mum just down the coast. She's a Brunswick heads. Okay. Yep. So nice to catch up with her. Cool. Yep. So tell me about this car. This car's a little beauty. Um, it's an SS, Commodore, uh, V8. It's only done about 125,000 Ks. Um, we've got it on the market for $12,990. Okay. Um, it's a great it's car. I think it's very one, tidy looking. It is. One, one drive and you'll buy, I'd imagine. Yeah. It's one of those cars, yeah. Just really. Is it the sort of thing you're looking for? Oh yeah, it's about the right size for me. Yeah. So, um, so that'd be good. So, um, yeah, what, how many owners? Do you know the history? I, I believe it's got two owners. Um, the logbook is in there, in the glove box. Um, okay. We can go through that. Um, it's got new tyres, uh, good rego. We just put six months rego on. Um, I think it'd suit what you're after. Okay. Um, how many, how many kilometres, you say? 125, 125,000. Okay. Um, is the engine getting a bit tired at that stage? No, it's been fully reconditioned. Oh, really? Yep. Yep. Which probably cost today on a V8 would be about 3500 Okay, so it's a V8. V8. 
lovely oh, wow. ads. <laughs> <laughs> so um, that's going to knock my fuel economy around, but it's going to be fun. It depends. On your, do, you do long trips, short trips? I do a long trip every now and then. Long trips, I think you'll find it better than a four-cylinder. Okay. Yeah. So what's actually been done in the reconditioning? Reconditioning, I'm not a mechanic. Um, but it's been fully pulled down, they've re-sleeved the cylinders. Um, I don't think it's gone as far as blueprinting, but they would have done about three and a half gram would give you new heads and sleeves in the motor. Okay. And what's the what's the uh, price again? Uh, price is twelve nine nine. Twelve nine nine. Okay. Is that your absolute bottom line? There's always room to move. But I'd love to go up, but you won't let me do that. <laughs> You're probably right. You're probably right. Okay. Um, yeah, well, it's a nice car. I, I, if I were going to buy it, I think I'd take it for a drive. I, I think you should buy it. I'm excited for you. <laughs> Beautiful. So, Brett, how did you go? Well, I, th I reckon... I picked two lies. Yep. I think um, the kilometres, you might have lied about the kilometres. Yeah, uh, yeah. Yeah, good. Got me there. Got All right. <laughs> and, um, and the engine recondition. I don't think that yeah. was true. I might have let the, didn't want the truth to spoil a good story. <laughs> <laughs> but I couldn't pick anything else. How many lies were there supposed to be? There were actually three lies. He doesn't okay. normally lie when he's selling cars at all. Yep. We asked him to specifically lie. He's not an actor, he's a, he's a real car salesman. And he, he, he is very natural, but then those three particular areas seem to stand out. And there were yeah. some lying signs there. Yeah, yeah. extended um, eye contact was one thing I sort of got when, you, gotcha. when I asked you about the kilometres the second time. You yep. were sort of... Kind of begging, me. begging me to believe. <laughs> yeah, they uh, work, don't they? Yeah. Like that? yeah, and you seemed a little bit unsure about the uh, uh, the engine recondition. Yeah, yeah. yeah. worked well. Thanks, okay. mate. Well done. Thanks very and much. The price was the other one. Oh, the price was the other one. Okay. Yeah. What right. would a car like this normally sell for? Uh, we'd sell that car for seven nine nine. Right. Okay. Maybe three okay. five one four. Okay. So oh, you got fantastic. ripped off by five thousand dollars, Brett. We need a bit more <laughs> practice. Just <laughs> on doing the right bit, the price right. <laughs> okay. Thanks very much. Cheers. Cheers. All right. Thank, Thank you. you. Cheers. Bye. My training with David was officially over. I now had the knowledge I needed and how to apply it to catch lies. Thinking back to the car yard test, I was pretty pleased at how I was able to pick out two of the three lies using my newly acquired knowledge. I was able to notice Scott's extended eye contact when he lied about the mileage, and even the tiny smile that played on his lips when he thought he'd got away with it. I was able to pick that he was lying about the engine reconstruction because of his overly detailed response. That was out of character with his baseline behaviour. But I did miss the lie about the price. But if I was really looking at buying a car, my prior research would have told me what price a car like that would sell for. So realistically, I would have had three for three. Well, it's been quite a journey and uh, tell you what, I'm glad that I've taken it. I now know that with the right knowledge and practice, it's possible to become quite a good lie catcher. But the other thing I've got to remember is that nobody gets it right 100% of the time. So I've got to be very careful before I go calling someone a liar. Will I use this on my friends and family? Probably not. For one thing, it's very hard. It takes a lot of effort. I don't want to be on all the time. On the other hand, I can see plenty of situations in my future where this is going to be a very handy skill.